In John 8 and 44, he said, you are of your father the devil. Now, you probably didn't grow up like I did, but things were, being the only boy in a household, it was kind of rough. Many times I was referred to as the devil. <laughs> but you know, males are males and females are females. I'll tell what the world's trying to do. I didn't always deal with my sisters. It didn't work that way. And he goes on and, and, he, and he's talking to these people around him, and these guys that think they just got it all sewed up. He said, and the lust of your father you will do. Yeah, anybody ever heard the term chip off the old block? Or you're just like your mom, or you're just like your dad, or you look. You will do just like what you're birthed into. Oh, yeah, you know where I'm going. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode, and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. But you have to understand what stemmed and caused Jesus to make that statement was verse 39. And the answer to him, Abraham is our father. Wait a minute, you don't understand. Abraham. You know, like what we do, you get into trouble, where do you run? You run to dad. Feeling like garbage to you in trouble. Jesus says something here. I want you to get this. Jesus said, if he were able to kill them, you would do the work of Abraham. Abraham. Yes. Let's place our Bibles down. I'm fixing them. You can put the Bibles down and get your wheelbarrow ready. No, I'm not. We're going to have fun tonight. Amen. Come on. Amen. But you ain't going to go home empty handed. I hope you don't go, go home empty hearted. And I don't want anybody leaving empty handed. Let's lift up our hands and love the Lord. Jesus, we need you. Lord, allow me, Lord, to walk nimbly and skillfully in your word tonight that I may. Treat, encourage, help people to glean from your word tonight, Lord, that we would honestly understand to choose the winning side with our life and our choices. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We like winners. We like winning. We, we, we like what winning feels like. There's a, a poem that uh, talks about the, the people who say it can't be done. It says, the man who misses all the fun is he who says it can't be done. In solemn pride, he stands aloof and greets each venture with reproof. Had he the power, he'd efface the history of the human race. We'd have no radio or trolley cars, no streets lit by electric stars, no telegraph or telephone. We'd linger in the age of stone. The world would sleep if things were run by the people who say it can't be done. Anybody want to win? That being said and realizing that Jesus returned and said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Anybody here love Jesus? Okay, you do? There's an old Hasidic rabbi rabbinic story that was told that there was this rabbi who was renowned for his, his, his just his astute intellect and his, his piety. He one day was conducting his, his business and he was unexpectedly confronted one day by one of his devoted followers in a burst of feeling, the young disciple explained, my master, I love you. The rabbi looked up from his studies and asked his fervent disciple, do you know what hurts me, my son? The young man was puzzled. Composing himself, he stammered and 
I, I don't understand, Rabbi. I'm, I'm trying to tell you how much you mean to me, and you confuse me with irrelevant questions. The rabbi replied, my question is neither confusing nor irrelevant. For if you do not know what hurts me, how can you truly love me? I ask again, do you love Jesus? Do you know what hurts me? In 1 Kings chapter 18, 21, Elijah came to all the people and said, how long all ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if thou, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Deuteronomy 13 and 19, the Lord says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, Choose life, yes. that both thou and thy seed may live. In Exodus 32 and 26, it said that Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. I know my title says choosing the winning side. But I want to approach it from a different direction. I want to talk about changing sides. And not by vocal declarations. But by including actions and activities. There are people who would have done well to change sides in life. But for some reason they couldn't. They wouldn't or can't break the chains of those connections. There's a man who had several sons. And if in your mind's eye you could go there, I see him sitting on the rickety old wooden chair that creaked when he moved. Sitting there, his face ashen and weathered by time and looking out over his property. It had become overgrown and unkept in the last few years. He's sitting there in his rickety chair that creaks when he moves, and he's remembering happier days when his strapping sons were playing games and working around the property. Now the weeds have taken over. There's no more sounds of life coming from the house or from chores being done. In fact, chores are now left undone. The, the crops and what there is are untended and going unharvested. He is facing financial ruin and it seems his life has gone down. For several years now it has gone from bad to worse and then to even disaster. He sits on his porch now, a bitter old man, wondering where he went wrong. He, he tried to do things. He, he tried to do what he thought was right, and he was convinced of, of his choices and his commitments. And at one point in time, things were so fantastic that there was no way you could convince him he was wrong. He and his family had fame and recognition and all the accolades they wanted. People spoke their name and all, and now he was known. Everyone knew about his five sons. Five strong, strapping boys. It was not uncommon in his day. Many people had multiple sons. But what was uncommon was the quality of his sons. You see, all five of his sons were destined to be champions. Tall, strong, formidable, challenging, warriors of the highest level. His family was destined to greatness. Uh, they knew that songs would be sung of this family for generations. And he was right. 
But sadly, the songs ultimately that were to be sung would come from a different viewpoint. As he sits in that rickety old chair, he allows his mind once again to go down memory lane. The early years of his boys growing up and how quickly they outgrew their clothes. Those boyhood brotherly scraps between them, settling their disputes, channeling their physical abilities in the right direction. He allowed himself a brief smile as he remembered their early success. No one in the entire territory could compete with them. As they grew, their renown spread further and further across the country, and finally they became national heroes. And he was a proud father. When the time finally came and the eldest son was asked to go to battle against the hated enemy, the father was so proud. Certainly, he never once considered his son could lose. No one in the nation could come close to defeating this tall, strapping, strong son. He watched with pride as his son left for the battlefield. His heart filled with fatherly pride. That's my boy. He expected the tale of the battle to come, that he would tell the story for years, that he would be able to reiterate the physical prowess and the accomplishments of his sons to others. He retold the story, but the telling instead was gut-wrenching and horrible. Because you see, this undefeatable, tall, powerful son lost his life in this battle. Not only did his son lose, but he lost to a very small and unknown young man that wasn't even a soldier. In fact, he lost to an untrained shepherd boy. Actually, just a laugh, it still seemed surreal that his son, the, the greatest warrior in the land, could be killed by a boy. How many tears of rage and frustration racked his mind as he tried to wrap around the idea of his son wrestling and strengthening himself with his brothers to lose to a boy. Bitter sorrow still washes over him every time he revisits this memory. A sick feeling permeates into his stomach, and he sobs in that old chair. By this time, he can't stop his mind, and it switches to autopilot. And he goes to the funeral in his mind that horrible day. And he laid his eldest son to rest. He barely remembers the weeks that passed because it was a blur of pain struggle. He was shamed and inconsolable. And slowly after a long time, although the pain did not subside, the anger waned. Life continued on. Gradually in the home, around the table with his remaining sons, he could occasionally smile and sometimes laugh. And then an unbelievable thing happened. The second son grew old enough and was called to battle, preparing to redeem the family name. He would restore the prestige that had been turned to the verda, the social anxiety and looks, the dreaded whispers at the marketplace as they walked by. This son would redeem and change what their name meant. No, no one ever said anything directly, but the whispers and the rumors were out there about how his older brother had been defeated. With mixed feelings and hope, 
in a twinge of pride, the old man watched his second son prepare himself to redeem the family name. Surely this would cure the blight. This, this would be the moment and that it would help heal an old wound. The old man remembers well the news coming to him that unbelievably his second son had fallen in battle and was killed. The funeral of blur. His inner feelings of rage are out of control, and there are times it's so bad that the family could hear their father somewhere out on the property in the distance, coming to the painful grips with an unexpected death of a second son. Weeks and months of not showing his face in public because of his shame. Twice his sons, who were incredible warriors, had been killed by inferior enemies. What do you say? How do you answer? He just tested their piety and their ridiculous effort to those who knew him to show support. They didn't understand my sons are dead, and he refused to find comfort. But as I digress this evening, it's, it's almost too incredible to tell you that this scenario that I'm telling you repeated itself five times. The third son went, then the fourth son, then the day son number five left for battle. Five tall, strong Sons, all champions. And today he finds himself sitting on a porch with nothing but dead dreams and weeds. His life is empty. There's no noise of grandsons. There's no wrestling, roughhousing. He is surrounded by the bitter sound of silence. When life called to his family with his champion sons, it was Israel who called. Who is Ishbi Benah? Who is one by one David? And his men had taken out the sons of the giant of Gath. How does this apply to me today, Pastor? The question today, tonight, after all the pain and struggles, is a simple one. Did the old man ever wish he had been? Others had changed sides. Other people had changed sides. Uriah the Hittite. Eddie the Gittite. This man could have stopped the hemorrhage in his life, the pain of loss a long time ago. His sons, instead of being corpses buried, could have been national heroes. But he never had the courage or even the good sense to simply change. He kept playing the same game until he lost everything. Now broken and bitter, the old man had nothing but a graveyard and bitterness to fill his day. To find this story in your Bible, if you'll turn with me as I read these verses, it says in 2 Samuel 21, 15 through 22, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down in his service with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint, and Ishobah, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass and weight. He being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But 
Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob, then to be child, the Hushite slew Sam, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elhanan, the son of Jeroboam, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, and there was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six bows, four and twenty in number. And he also was born of the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born of the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his son. I wonder. Why didn't the old man just change sides? Why do I ask this? What will it really take for you to finally really go all in on the winning side? What's it really going to take for you to decide, I don't want to be sitting in a rocker with regret. I don't want to sit around and, and count losses. I'm hopeful. Why don't I just get on the winning side? Why, why don't I just choose? Hmm. I, I, I wonder if, 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 if he just thought, you know what? After Goliath, uh, I should have just cut my losses and changed sides. Certainly after Ishi Benab. What stopped him from going all in? What, what stopped him from really saying, you know what? I know who... God is. Let me really serve him. This other stuff ain't working. This, this, this other lifestyle ain't working. I, 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 let me get down with you. Let me, let me tell some of you. Yeah, God, at some point, you got to decide, you know what? I ain't getting out of here alive. I want to be on the one inside. Okay, let me, let me say something. That. We got some wonderful married folks around here. But how many beyond married, marriage is work? That's good work, but it's work. Hey, 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 young man, girls, don't give yourself to no joker. Oh, the world's doing it, but they ain't winning. You really want to wake up at 20 and have a kid from a dad you no longer know where he's at? Oh, how many likes money in the bank? Really? Well, why don't you put your life in the bank and say, you ain't touching it. Oh, everybody's doing it. No, they're not. No, they're not. He's coming for a church without Shabbat and without Zinko. And I refuse to believe that some of these little girls and some of these little boys and some of these young ladies and some of these young men aren't going to be there. There's going to be something to say. As for me and my house, we're going to choose the winning time. I ain't going to do them drugs. I'm not going to have penurial sex. I'm not going to get those diseases. I'm not going to live that lifestyle. I choose to win. It's not party time. It's education time. It's develop myself time. You know what? You know they say we don't have children as musicians anymore. You know why? Because they're playing video games instead of learning an instrument. When you get to be my age, you don't want to play. You don't want to play video games, but you wish you could play an instrument. See, some of you don't understand. Get on the winning side. Invest in you. Oh, I'm fixing to say something. You're being taught by this world that they owe you. They don't owe you nothing. And I give you something to say, you owe you. Anybody ever bought a car? What do you get with that car? What do you get when you go buy a new car? So start with the W. Yeah, start with the G. Guarantee. How many wants that? Something goes wrong. Well, why don't you ask for a warranty or a guarantee from yourself? Why don't you start doing for you what you expect? You want a great life? Then start living a great life. If you want what's best, don't accept anything less. Uh, 
I, I know they say, well, see, but I like to, yeah, there's a lot of things I like to do, but I, I can't win doing those things. Listen, listen, you got to understand, there's so many people better than me. There's so many people, they got, so, they got more tools, they got more everything. So I can go sit in court and cry about I don't get all the advantages. Oh, I can just get up early and take advantage of what I got. Uh, I don't want to go too far down this road. This, that, this, that message ain't ready yet. Y'all ain't ready for that one. Y'all, y'all, I don't know if you have the mindset for that yet. Some of you spend so much time on social media. Some of us old folks do too. Some of you watching TV. You watch. I'm not going to preach against it. But what are you doing all that for? Are you that boring? Are you that pathetic that you don't want to watch you? You don't want to watch you? You want to sit there and watch some fake fictitious junk? You want to watch that and lose three hours? Of you you want to live it. You want to want to watch you. You want to want to watch you win. You sing, you preach, you pray, you succeed, you win. Get out of that chair and live a life and win. Some of you are, I'm just going to, some of you are so prideful, but you've been making the mistake, the mistake for so long, you're too prideful to quit. Admit, I could have done better. You, you sold yourself. I hope when you look around and see the Babylon that you built, it was worth your life. Because treasure here don't equate to treasure there. As his sons fell, as his future ran through his hands like sand, I wonder why he never changed sight. Why do people keep living in the land they live? Why do people keep living with the ideology? I mean, is your ideology really like the Lord's? When you say you love the Lord, you have to then ask, do you know what hurts him? There ain't nothing more tragic than a wasted life. There's nothing even more tragic than an aborted life. See, you don't have to be aborted physically. Some of you can abort your life. Oh, I'm too old. I'm too old. Who told you that? Who told? Who to, the mindset that you got, that you're so stuck, you can't work well with people, you can't get along with anybody, you've heard everything preached before, you can't. Who told you that? Because it wasn't God. Who told you to sit there and stagnate? Because it wasn't God. Who told you to sit there and blow off prayer and blow off a relationship and think you're just showing up to sit in a chair? You told yourself that. God didn't. You, let me check. Hold on. See. You know what you bought into? What they're saying out there. You didn't buy into what he's saying here. You see, when he gets somebody, hey, now baby's at 100 years old. Mm, I, I know what I'm up against. Some of you are sitting there going, oh. Why not come over to the land of blessing and favor? See, 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 some of you equate blessings with financial success. Oh, <laughs> if you don't read that in the word of God. You, you, you think success is everybody like you. Oh, man, you know what I am like, you know, there's going to be hundreds of people here. Yeah, but are you going to be greeted over there? Who are you pleasing? Who are you loving? You better know what hurts them. King Saul is going to come over. King Saul could have come over and lived happily ever after. But instead, he chased David all the way to suicide. And if 
What are you doing striving with a brother just trying to get something done in the church? What are you doing just, what are you doing at odds every time you turn around your odds with a sister in the church? What? Even Saul could have said, wait a minute. This, this young guy just showed me something. I missed it. Let me get it right now. He didn't have to die like that if he'd have changed sides. Some of you need to say, where are you getting your thought processes? Where are you getting your opinions from? Where are you getting this ideology? Where'd you get that from? See, y'all, the problem is, is I understand, I fight the same things. Everyone in this room and, and those just not like, there's sometimes I can't, I'm a, what? What am I, wait, wait, wait a minute. You, what, you don't think changing your mind is all right? Did pretty good for the prodigal son. He changed his mind. That adulterous woman changed her mind. That's a sad day when the prodigal son and adulterous woman can change your mind. And we sit here. You ain't moving me, Pastor. Ananias and Sapphira could have changed sides. Oh, they could have lived great lives with honor, dignity, and respect. Instead, they simply refused and stubbornly held their course, shipwrecked their own lives. See, I'm telling you, you got to choose. Demas could have changed sides. Paul could have spoken, wrote books with Demas and Timothy. But instead, he pursued small ideas. More important to fit in with that crowd than this crowd. Wants to impress them instead of the Lord. And he died with the name we speak of within shame. The list. It's longer every time I read the word of God. Judas. I mean this. Alexander. Diophrophes. Lucifer himself. This could be a good day to change that. Tonight could be a great night to say, you know what? He might be on to something today. You know, I might just say, you know what, folks? I get it. I've had this ideology. I've had these thoughts. But you know what? I think I'm going to switch sides. What does it mean to change sides? It means to join the other team. It means to wear their uniform. It means to turn around and defeat the old team. It even means to bring and recruit from the other side. Oh, we got some of the best players we ever had came from the. And such were some. Of, oh, what's sad is some of you were so good over there. What happened to you when you got here? You got all sorts of accolades about that side. Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me and all the sons of Levi. Gathered themselves unto him. I just wonder, I just wonder if that's why we have a Levitical priesthood. Oh, I just, I just wonder, I just wonder if, if maybe that wasn't, I just wonder if that started it in that plant. There ought to be something about people that are, say they're called to the ministry. Boy, bless God, they're going to jump, shout, and worship and get so behind any kind of church service that way. That way when they get up there, they're acting no different. I, 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 you know, when I realized Paul, in 1 Corinthians 21, said, be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ. Let me get back to him in a minute. Jesus looked at his disciples as some were walking away. We all notice what Peter said. 
Quickly say, come on, somebody. To whom, come on. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You know what he just said? But you're the one inside, Lord. But what did Jesus said, say to him? In verse 67, he said, will you also go away? What's he say? What side are you going to choose? Whose side are you going to choose? I called him Paul, but let's, let's not cheat the enemy of a black eye. Saul of Tarsus changing sides. Saul of Tarsus, their greatest player ever. Their GOAT, greatest of all time. He was killing Christians and destroying people and going into homes and, 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 and having people like Stephen, the premier disciples and apostles of the stone. Saul was their quarterback. He was their GOAT. But you know Saul tells the story. He tells the story of changing sides. In Acts 26, he said, and I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. I'm going to take a killer and make a minister. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to make a Christian out of you, boy. I'm going to make a soul winner. Demon stomping, devil killing, sin tracing. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna get you up. You're gonna come quarterback for us. I'm gonna make you a minister, a witness of both these things that thou hast seen, and those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles under whom now I sit. I'm fixing to turn you around and sin. You're changing sides, Saul, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive, that they, wait, that the others, oh, gee, may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among, are you hearing me? Them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, Paul says, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. Hey, King, why don't you come to the women's side? The plan of salvation is the key to being an ultimate winner. How do I get to the, how do I, how do I get on the other team, man? How, how, how do I get, can, can someone find Acts 237 for me? I almost shouldn't have to say that because we know we're going to Acts 238, but we have to understand and look at where people are going to get on the other side. How do you get on the other side? They ask, wait a minute, we're on the wrong side. We crucified Christ. Well, how do I get on the winning side? Ask someone to read that. We got anybody with the Bible in their hand? Thank you. Stay right there. Okay, we're on the wrong side. What do we do? I, I, I'm representing the wrong family over here. I'm of my father the devil over here. How do I get? Okay, they ask, what do they tell him to do? That's changing sides. That's being born into the winning family. Oh, we ought to love the Lord right now. I'm going to wrap this up as they come to the music. This is not something new. This is not something new. I, 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 I hope some of you aren't so bored with this side that you can't get wait to get home to paint the other side. I hope you're not more excited about getting out of here so you can go home and watch the other side. 
if you want to go home and go watch something and, and, and close your mind off and go entertain that instead of the Lord, you can go. But if there's anybody here that wants to be on the Lord and entertain the presence of the Lord, because when you say you love him, you know what hurts him, and so you want to praise him and bless him. You see, this is the age-old battle that came all the way out of the Old Testament and the New Testament because even Joshua recognized that you have to choose a side. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. You're choosing right now. You choose with your feet. You choose with your finances. You choose with your time. You choose with your efforts. You're choosing with your mindsets. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Let's all stand. They chose. They chose. You got to make up your mind. You got to make up your mind. And the, one of the greatest indicators of being having a made up mind is your ability to win people off the other side. You want the stamp of approval on your life, you'll walk with God. If you want the stamp of approval of a recognized side that you chose living for God, you'll have people coming right here because of your choice on whose side. The proof will be those who you're winning who you're reaching. Your life will be an undeniable testimony, just like Paul's. Hey, I used to be Saul. Let me tell you my story. I choose the winning side.